Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the future of games and applications of game technology. And of course, in order to understand the future, one has to look a bit at the past, um, also to see where we've come from. So it's very exciting to see how um, games have evolved, of course, since they kind of started, I think maybe with the earliest uh, examples in maybe the 50s and then yeah more in the 70s becoming popular and 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 there's been a lot of changes and i think it's very fascinating to look at those to see how rapidly it actually evolved um and then from there we can look at uh, some of the trends that are currently uh, happening and, and some things that may come up in the near future um, because one of the things like predicting the future is definitely not easy and, and um, if you ask an opinion about from an industry expert, it, it's usually not super reliable because it turns out to be really hard uh, to predict the future. But um, yeah, as an engineer, I, I think of it as like in physics, if, if something is in motion, um, it stays in motion unless there is a force that stops it. So that, that's how we can look at the trends, things that are already in motion and that are yeah, inevitably going to continue for a while and that may accelerate or they may uh, decrease in speed. Um, but other than that, I think it's always exciting to think about the future as, as an almost like brainstorming and, and seeing like how can the future, uh, what could happen in the future. And, and it's, it's just an exciting uh, exercise to do, even though the reliability may not be very high, but it is uh very useful to do when nevertheless when coming up with new ideas for new products um, that's where it gets really exciting um so this is also kind of why i'm excited about this because uh, well my company we do rapid prototyping with game technology um so basically um yeah um we help people um envision their first uh well their new concept and for the first time by making it actually playable and interactive prototype so they can interact with it um, and kind of try to see if, if users might enjoy this in the future um, so yeah um, just to quickly show a little bit uh, what game prototyping uh, entails like we we start by with a very simple version of the idea and then elaborate it across multiple iterations um, it can be applied over a lot of different areas. So this, the first one was an educational running game. This is a forklift safety training. Um, there is data visualization that you can do. You can use virtual reality, for example. So there's actually a lot of different applications. Of course, games, uh, in this case, uh, with augmented reality as well. Um, and then there is indeed also like uh, serious games where we uh, work together with universities that are doing pretty cutting edge research into how game technology can be used um, for other applications and, and what how, if that's even efficient and, and they're kind of studying that. Um, let's say, for example, in virtual reality, uh, they can compare um, like uh, training using virtual reality with traditional methods. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, but basically as uh, to kind of finish the introduction, like in, indeed, I'm based in Connecticut. Uh, we also have an office in, in Belgium, in Veteran, close to the city of Ghent. Um, so that's where most of our team is. So, but we're kind of across uh, both sides uh, of the Atlantic. So yeah, what I'm going to talk about is first of all, I want to bring a brief history of game technology, um, as I already kind of introduced. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the current trends and also briefly at uh, possible future evolutions. Now, um, in game technology, as I mentioned, um, yeah, it definitely evolved a lot over time. Um, so initially starting with, with like just games that were black and white graphics, um, it kind of quickly evolved. Um, so um, specifically when talking about 3D graphics, um, yeah, we see the first examples popping up in the 80s um, where you actually try to depict the world as, as in its three dimensions uh, for the first time in, in games and, and, and also in, in real time. So I think that's um, 
that that's actually one of the things that makes games um, stand apart. It, I mean, it's kind of it's basically a simulation of the real world, but you can also interact at the same time. Um, so it's interactive. You can and you get an immediate response to your interaction, and also because of that, it needs to render or display the world in, in real time. So. That's why you'll see that, um, yeah, the early examples of video games look pretty rudimentary while what was already possible in, for example, uh, CGI, computer uh, generated uh, graphics, um, was of course already a little higher because they could spend more time per frame. Like in this case, everything needs to, all the graphics need to be rendered at, at like, I don't know, at least, let's say 20 frames per second at the very least. So you can uh, react to it in real time. And that's what makes the medium unique um, and what, what makes game technology unique. Um, if you see back, uh, well, fast forward to 2019, you, you, we can already achieve a much more uh, realistic level of uh, graphics. Um, and Microsoft Flight Simulator being actually really impressive on there's a really interesting video online of kind of the making of it. Um, it's because they have the whole planet um, in a pretty high level of detail. Um, and so it kind of combines a lot of the cloud technology that, that Microsoft has. Um, and yeah, combined with AI and, and, and such to kind of fill in the details and fill in the gaps in the information. Um, but it, it's, yeah, it's coming. Uh, we've come a long way. Um, then when it comes to multiplayer, so, well, my previous two, Examples were about 3D graphics, how the 3D graphics evolved um, a lot. Um, there also, has also been an evolution in, in multiplayer. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, in 1997, uh, there was an Ultima Online, um, which was one of the first massively online multiplayer games where um, yeah, a lot of people could play it at the same time. So the graphics were pretty simple at the time, uh, but that also evolved a lot. Um, so now we have PUBG, uh, which is also a, an online uh, game with a lot of players um, where you battle each other. Um, and PUBG is actually um, the first uh, game that exceeded 1 billion uh, players. Uh, so this, these are, this is based on statistics from March of 2021. Um, so pretty new. Um, so there's a if you, if you look at uh, the most played video games by player counts on Wikipedia, there's a list. Um, there are some interesting things that we can see here. Um, of course, that we've exceeded 1 billion, the number of players in a game, uh, not of course at the same time, uh, but those are all the re registered players uh, accumulated over time. Uh, but that's the amount of people that were actually exposed to the game and actually uh, most likely also played it. Um, one other thing that we see, and this has been an evolution in the games industry, I think since maybe around 2010, when it started, it kind of started a bit with the iPhone and, and the App Store. Um, around that time where games became free to play, you could uh, obtain it for free, and then you can kind of spend money in the game using uh, microtransactions, as they initially called it, basically in-app purchases. Um, but because yeah, you have your phone, it's linked to your credit card, you can easily spend a little bit of money on a game. Um, it kind of solved the problem where people may not buy a game because it's they had to pay maybe 20 euros, 50 euros uh, in order to play it. Um, and now people can access a game, the barrier of entry is, is removed or it's very low. And you can also just spend one dollar in a game, uh, while others might spend more than the fixed price that you might. Uh, charge so that that was definitely an evolution that uh, where it was interesting how that expanded from uh, mobile games um, towards also PC games and console games um, that took a few years to kind of propagate uh, to the different gaming platforms but that was definitely an interesting evolution um, um, yeah I think that's yeah otherwise this is not a list of just online games but out of the first 10 I counted the seven of them are, are online games so uh, it's kind of maybe obvious because with multiplayer games you play with multiple people online it kind of takes more more people and people would invite other players they would invite their friends to kind of get into the game um, 
Uh, next uh, area where we saw some evolution was virtual reality. Uh, although the first example is not actually virtual reality or not, not in the sense that we know it. Uh, there was a, yeah, the Viewmaster, which maybe a lot of people know from their childhood, um, where you could see um, yeah, stereoscopic images through a device that kind of uh, looks like a, somehow like a VR headset in, in a way, because VR headsets offer uh, also stereoscopic images, but the difference is, of course, that there is display technology that updates it in real time, combined with the sensor that detects in which direction you're looking. So, and then of course other sensors as well, um, in order to offer a good experience. Um, so in the beginning, there were some first uh, VR arcade games. That was kind of a little bit of a, a hype at the time. Um, it didn't go very far. And it's really with the advent of more accessible, cheaper technology that um, it was. It became possible around 2012 for Oculus to to launch this idea with their Kickstarter campaign, and then and then get really successful, and later even acquired by Facebook. Um, so this is how the, the VR, uh, the current wave of VR, uh, took off. Um, so currently, there's a latest iteration, which is Oculus Quest 2, um, which is a VR device that is self-contained. The computer is embedded in the device. Um, it's, it's wireless, uh, it just has a battery. It's kind of like a VR device with a built-in phone. It has cameras, so it, it uses optical tracking from the point of view of the user, so you can basically go anywhere. It's not like there, there's a tracking system that you have to hang up in your room. And then you have the trackers that can track your hands, so you can you can really move around. Um, and and it's, it's pretty, uh, yeah, it, it's a big evolution uh, within this, uh, I mean, yeah over just a few years. Um, then augmented reality is also the use of game technology where Boeing uh, started uh, playing around with this in 1992 um, to kind of help instruct um, like cabling or wiring uh, for airplanes. Um, and then in 2020, um, this is just an example for what I used like with the, basically with the iPhone 12, um, you have a, a lighter, which is a little extra sensor that you have in the phone, um, which they added. Um, it's, it's nothing new in terms of technology, but it's new that you have it on the phone, basically. Um, so you can now use that to do 3D scanning using your phone. So it's kind of here that it, it does, of course, blend a bit with other areas. Um, this is not just video games. There, is, there are some games that use this technology, but it, it, it ties very tightly into game technology where um, you can scan objects yourself. Um, you could use that in, in, a, in, a, in an application that uses real-time rendering using game technology in order to achieve something. And, and one of the simplest things that I do with it is like if I need to buy furniture, this was recently uh, because we moved uh, to a new house and uh, now we still lack a lot of furniture. So. Uh, um, a little while ago, we were looking for couches and I, we went into the store and I said, okay, this couch feels like, I'm not sure if it will fit or if it, yeah, if it, maybe it's too big or I don't know if I can walk around it. Um, so what I did is I, I used this uh, app called 3D Scanner app uh, and then I just scanned the couch in, in the store and that took me like only one minute to produce um, and then I could actually put it in a house. Um, it would anchor it. It would uh, anchor it to the actual space. I could place it somewhere using a technology called SLAM, uh, simultaneous locating and mapping. Uh, it would kind of keep track of where my phone is in space and, and where to put the virtual couch. And I could actually pretend to go sit in it, look at the view, kind of walk around it, see if uh, there's enough room to pass. Uh, so this was a very simple use, but kind of a bit of a game changer. Um, and then actually we didn't end up buying that couch, um, but then we went into a store and we saw another couch uh, that we liked. It was really well priced, so it was in a thrift store. Um, and we said, okay, yeah, it's time to buy this couch. Uh, we we want to be able to receive some guests again after COVID. Um, and I wanted to see if this couch that was in the store wasn't too big. So what I did is I just overlaid it using this simple app. Um, to put the other couch to see, I wanted to make sure it's a bit, at least a bit smaller than that couch or not bigger. 
so that way I could just uh, overlay it and, and kind of have a sense. So this is the actual picture. This is just in real time. I could actually walk around and, and see that couch. Um, so I think that's a pretty interesting uh, application. Um, okay, so now um, for some of the current trends. Um, an important trend that we've seen is the use of technology outside of games, um, for example, in education, professional training, and healthcare. Um, so basically, um, well, it kind of started a bit as a, a hype or the trend, uh, which was called serious games. It's still a term that's being used, it's still around. Um, in the beginning, it was like an idea like, oh, we can use games for other applications. And it was something that came a lot from the games industry, where people were trying to look uh, for new markets. Um, of course, if you push something really fast, it doesn't always work, but it, it does set things in motion. Um, and that's, that's what we've seen. Um, so it took a little longer and over, over some time and also just people that grew up um, playing games as a child, um, they yeah, they, they just started uh, their careers and, and entered all kinds of different fields and, and started to take this technology with them. Because, um, yeah, it's kind of a, you could see it as a language that a lot of people now understand. Um, and this is why I think the adoption of game technology outside of games has actually increased and is still going to continue to increase. Um, and I do think we can look at some of the past uh, trends as well, like um, if we see that um, online games really came up, like first, of course, we had games starting in the 70s. So those people are uh, climbed all the way up in management and, and all kinds of companies and industries. Um, now we have a lot of online multiplayer games that are also going to, uh, those players are, are going to, uh, to grow further in, in, in those companies as well. And, and, and I do think we're, there might be a bit of a, delay effect there where we receive these entertainment products, these things can start to enter in, in, into those businesses and, and affecting all those industries. Um, so yeah, um, basically in the beginning, people started pushing uh, game technology in, in, in new areas. Um, then also the companies that actually create the game technology, so there's Unity technologies with the Unity engine. There's Epic Games with the Unreal Engine. There's also Crytek with the CryEngine. Um, but basically, um, they started also noticing, and about I think four or five years ago, they really uh, started recognizing that people actually use their technology not only to make games. So they started supporting that and, and even writing out some grants, like for example. Uh, Epic has the uh, Epic Mega Grants, where people can apply for any project using uh, game technology. Um, so that, that's pretty exciting and, and really helping. Um, so yeah, we've seen a lot of um, applications. As, I mean, as a prototyping company, we, we help to develop them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting to see all the different applications. Uh, also, for example, in healthcare, um, there is assessment of, of like for example cognitive skills that you can do through a game people get distracted they play a game and meanwhile they can measure and learn something um, there is also a vr for distraction uh, during surgery with local anesthesia for example so there's a lot of different applications um, so yeah some of the future evolutions um, and i see where i'm very close to the end of the time um, but um, yeah there are some uh, Devices that are rumored that would come out by Apple and also Facebook and Oculus uh, with Oculus VR being part of Facebook. Uh, so th those companies are, uh, yeah, it's pretty certain they're working on uh, augmented reality devices that would uh, could really step up the technology, uh, again, the big step. Um, I do think uh, the use of the LiDAR on mobile, um, it really helps to quickly capture and convey, convey the size of something. So I think that is a technology that could be used more. Um, also something I didn't mention yet, but uh, of course the use of blockchain and uh, non-fungible tokens and, and games, it's something that's really hot. A lot of game developers right now are looking into prototyping games, using it or de already developing them and putting them on the markets. Uh, so blockchain is a way to uh, kind of technology behind uh, Bitcoin and such to uh, securely verify transactions, which 
could be important with uh, multiplayer games. Um, so uh, otherwise, uh, AI has a lot of promise. So there's actually a YouTube channel called One Minute Papers. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend it if this area interests you. Um, but they're um, yeah, looking into different applications of um, how AI can potentially in real time um, affect those, those graphics, for example, to make better graphics, but also just to use to understand player behavior and then offer a more optimal experience, kind of configuring the game or the experience, depending on the user by just detecting how they play or how they interact with the software. Um, so yeah, that's all really exciting. Um, so yeah, um, just one final note when we're talking about game technology and the whole evolution about graphics and, and even I, I would say simulating the real world or understanding it is, is that it's not, um, this is not just a, a temporary trend or anything. It, it's some, it, I, I think it's a, our innate nature as human beings to, to want to kind of, on one hand, depict uh, reality um, and of course, maybe simulate desired outcomes. And, and of course, if you go back to the cave paintings of, of Lascaux, which were made uh, around 17,000 years ago, uh, you can see that it's, it's nothing new. People like to depict the reality around them and kind of imagine what they would like to encounter. Uh, so yeah, with this note, I would like to uh, end my presentation. Um, thank you very, very much uh, for your attention.